We are elated, we're ecstatic that this is an opportunity that you as citizens to buy in on what we are trying to do. Because rather, my name is Beulah Nash Tichi, instead of saying teacher, is Tichi. I happen to be the president of the local NAACP. Uh, and I will share with you, it wasn't the NAACP initiative to take on this challenge. We were asked to join others, so we are delighted to be a part of the group. So uh, what I want to do is to say a short prayer, and then I will introduce our speaker. And I do believe in prayer. I am a Christian. I'm not going to impose my values on anyone. So I will say a short prayer, and then if you'd like to share a prayer, we'll go forward. Amen. Amen. We have four distinguished panelists. So the process is going to be, they will present their information, and at the end, each speaker is going to speak for about 30 minutes. Am I correct, John? 10 to 15. 10 to 15 minutes. And then there'll be a QA. and a uh, You have an opportunity to ask questions, and always remember, we all value each other. We have to respect each other. So we may or may not agree, but as long as we can disagree in a respectful way and to go forward, I think that's the most important fact. And I will, I'm going to give a little information about each speaker, and when they come to you, they will give additional information as applicable. Our first speaker on my document is Melissa. Magon, would you raise your hand for Lissa? Lissa is a public historian who is relatively new in the Augusta area. She has a BA from Mercer Hurt College and an MA from the University of Florida. Dr. Bobby Donaldson, Bobby, Dr. Donaldson, raise your hand. He's an associate professor of history at the University of South Carolina and director of its Center for Civil Rights, History, and Research. He is uh, an Augusta native with a BA from Wesley University and a PhD from Emory. Harvey White, would you raise your hand, is a public historian with a BA from Georgia State and MA from the University <coughs> of West Georgia. She's a graduate and young professional committee, chair of the National Council for Public History since August of last year, and she has been a proud member of Augusta for a while. Thank you. And Dr. John Hayes, associate professor of history at Augusta University, AU. He is an Atlantic native Welcome to Augusta with the BA from Wake Forest University and an MTS from Duke, Un Duke Divinity School. Excuse me. And a PhD from the University of Georgia. Ladies and gentlemen, these are our panelists. Now, who would be first? Thank you. And if you could please mute your phone, so uh, if you have a phone, please mute. <coughs>
chapters were established throughout the South during this time. The first one was found yeah. in Winchester, Virginia. Uh, Mary Dunbar Williams and Eleanor Williams Boyd. They were sister-in-laws. They were concerned about the number of Confederate dead. Closer to the microphone, oh. please. Yes. It's hard to hear you. Well, or I can break it. <laughs> Is that better? No. Yeah. no? Not really, no. Did she bring the port of mine? She needed batteries for the port of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Can you take the mic off there? Okay. How about now? Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Um, so the first was formed in Winchester, Virginia, and it was started by Mary Dunbar Williams and Eleanor Williams Boyd, who were sister-in-laws. Uh, they were concerned because they saw a lot of Confederate dead unburied or buried in big shallow graves. Um, on the battlefields throughout the town and the surrounding area. So they called a town meeting uh, with the town's wealthier white women. And at this first meeting, um, they agreed to organize a memorial society specifically to rebury the Confederate dead. And this was formed out of the need. You have to remember, this is the first time that death was experienced on such a large and massive scale in the United States for both the North and the South. And so um, people had to shift their mourning process and their mourning traditions. It became a very public display of loss and grief as opposed to what had happened before, which was a very private and personal one. So that this society formed out of that need as well. and. So they agreed to organize and give the Confederate dead proper, proper burials in one central cemetery. They held fundraisers and bought a section of land which became known as the Stonewall Cemetery and this opened in 1866. They also agreed that they would place flowers in the graves annually and um, upkeep the graves. So they had two main goals. Every chapter in LMA was in the first one bury or rebury the Confederate dead, and then the second one was to create monuments in their honor. They hoped that the Confederate cemeteries and monuments would be physical reminders of the Confederate lost cause for future generations of the South. And they didn't just uh, create the cemeteries and move on. They also had celebrations, which were referred to <coughs> as Memorial Days, and these were specifically to celebrate the, the Confederate dead and the cause um, hundreds, if not thousands of citizens would attend these celebrations, and at this time they would decorate graves, there would be prayer, um, people would participate in song, and there would be speeches, things like that. It would be the whole community gathering and participating in these, in these memorial days. So the Augusta Ladies Memorial Association as early as 1866, immediately following the war, there was a call for a formation of, of a group who could take care of Confederate graves in and around the Augusta area. Um, individual groups and different pockets of Augusta women answered this call, and it wasn't until two, late, two years later in 1868 that an official chapter of LMA um, was formed here in Augusta, and they formed out of the Ladies Hospital and Relief Association, which <coughs> formed during during the Civil War. Mrs. John Carter was president, and Mrs. H. H. Steiner was the vice president, and their first act was to acquire a special sec section of the cemetery, and they commissioned uniform headstones for all of the graves. They were also interested from the very start in creating a monument but it was originally intended to be placed within the cemetery walls with all of, the, all, of, all of Augusta's Confederate dead listed on the monument. Um, in 1873, after the death of both the president and the vice president of, M of LMA, the organization had to reorganize. They elected a new president, this is F.A. Timberlake, and focus was brought back on creating a monument. Two years later, 1875, plans had changed for the location and the design of the monument. Um, they wanted 
it to be in the most public place possible so that the thousands of people who lived in and traveled through Augusta would be able to pay homage to the Confederate soldiers' sacrifice. And this particular chapter was um, active until 1894 when they reformed into the Augusta chapter of the Daughters of the Confederacy. So for those of you who don't know, this is the location of the Confederate <coughs> monument. It is on the 700 block, median block, um, downtown, just a couple blocks away. And that is the full monument there. It was, like I said, it was commissioned by the Augusta chapter LMA in 1875. It's made of marble, granite, and brick. It was designed by the architectural firm Van Greeter and Young of Philadelphia. It was built by the Mark, Wal Mark Walter firm of Augusta and carved by Antonio Fontana in Italy. And those were the, the marble figures who were carved in Italy. The design and construction cost over $20,000 and it was officially dedicated on October 31st, 1878. So there was two ceremonies, uh, main ceremonies, surrounding the Confederate monument. The first was focused on the laying of the cornerstone, which happened on April 26, 1875, which was the Augusta <coughs> Memorial Day. And the second was the unveiling and dedication of the complete monument, which, as I said, October 31st, 1878, three and a half years later. So like many types of these ceremonies throughout the South, there were thousands in attendance civilians, various military and civic organizations, Augusta's town officials, judges, clergy, and of course, Confederate veterans. And they were very, it was very similar to a regular Memorial Day celebration. There were speeches, prayers, music, and a large procession throughout town. And so now I'm just going to go around the monument and um, show everybody what's on the monument and who the figures are, just briefly. So this is the inscription on the east side or the front side of the monument. It says, Our Confederate Dead. Next we have the west or the back side and it says, Erected AD 1878 by the Ladies Memorial Association of Augusta in honor of the men of Richmond County who died in the cause of the Confederate States. The north side says, in memoriam, no nation rose so white and fair, none fell so pure in crime. The inscription on the south side says, <coughs> worthy to have lived and known our gratitude, worthy to be hallowed and held in tender remembrance, Worthy, worthy the faithless fame which Confederate soldiers won who gave themselves in life and death for us. For the honor of Georgia, for the rights of the states, for the liberties of the people, for the sentiments of the South, for the principles of the Union, as these were handed down to them by the fathers of our common country. Next, we'll, we'll start at the top. Um, the first figure is a figure of a Confederate soldier located on the top of the monument. He is dressed in his uniform holding a rifle and he was meant to represent all the enlisted men in the Confederacy. Next, we have General Robert E. Lee. He's best known as the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, he chose to follow his home state despite his desire to, despite his desire for the country to remain intact. He also famously opposed the construction of public monuments and memorials, saying that they keep open the sores of war. And he was chosen to represent the Confederacy. The next figure is Thomas R. R. Cobb. He is a Georgia native, an outspoken advocate of slavery and succession, served on a committee that drafted the Confederate Constitution. Um, he was killed in the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862, so he never saw this monument and um, he was chosen to represent the state of Georgia. The next figure is of William Henry Talbot Walker. He was born here in Augusta and attended Richmond Academy before entering West Point. Likely, he had been serving in the U.S. Army um, but chose his home state um, after, after they seceded. And he owned 14 slaves here in Augusta 
He also died uh, in battle, 1864, in the Battle of Atlanta. And he was chosen for the monument to represent Richmond County and the city of Augusta. This is General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson, another um, well-known Confederate figure, probably the best known after Lee. He played a prominent role in nearly all military engagements in the Eastern Theater um, until his death in 1863. And he never publicly spoke in favor for or against the institu institution of slavery, but he did own slaves. And likely he was chosen to represent the Confederacy as a whole on this monument. And then around in between each figure on the corners. Um, the first one we have here, it's De Windeke, which uh, is Latin, it means with God our defender, and that was the national motto of the Confederate States. Words, the words are within a band, um, I don't know how you, well you can see it, they're within, within a band, and then there's a flag. Um, there's guns on either side with a drum and cannonballs in between, and beneath this is a trumpet. All symbols of of the army. Next here we have more symbols. Uh, laurel leaves, a symbol of honor, flanked by two flags with cross rifles and cannons. Next, the relief um, inscribed with the word Constitution in an arch over three columns. Each column has a woman standing on it, and on the right side of this scene, you can't its you can't really see it that well, um, but there's a soldier, and then on the left side, there is a farm and field workers. And then the very last uh, relief is of two intertwined flags and a cross gun and a sword. So that is, that's all I have. So that's a quick rundown of of the monument, a little bit of its history, um, and the rest of the speakers will get more in depth.
So white Southern writers and artists and veterans, um, women's associations and political leaders of the 19th and early 20th centuries, um, yeah, they thought to justify the, 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 um, the Civil War as a moral victory. Um, they had God on their side and um, justification um, for slavery um, came from the Bible. Um, there are a few basic tenets of the lost cause. Um, the first one, um, maybe the one that people hear most often, is that it was states' rights and not slavery that were the main cause um, of the Civil War. Um, now, if you read any um, of the secession papers or speeches like that, slavery is always mentioned. Um, I can read a few of them for you. Um, the, Texas, the Texas Declaration um, for Secession, written on February 2nd of 1861, stated, we hold as undeniable truths that governments of the various states of the Confederacy itself were established ex exclusively by the white race for themselves and their posterity, that the African race has no agency in their establishment, that they were rightfully held and regarded as inferior and, depen and dependent race, and that in condition only could their existence in the country be rendered beneficial or tolerable. Um, the Mississippi uh, Causes for Secession stated, quote, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Um, and I could go on and name some more. South Carolina one um, said, a geographical line has been drawn across the Union, and all the states north of that line have united in the election of a man to high office of President of the United States, whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. Um, and that was written in December 20, on December 24th of 1860. Um, some more tenets of the, um, of the Civil War, in addition to that slavery was not the cause, was that the enslaved were grateful to their enslavers. Um, and you see that later on in kind of pop culture references like Gone with the Wind um, and Birth of a Nation. You see that kind of myth in the meaning character of the faithful and loyal slave. Um, the Lost Cause also said that generals and soldiers were heroic and saintly, think Robert E. Lee, so he was the, like, the main hero of the, of the Confederacy and of this Lost Cause narrative. Um, it said that the war was noble and heroic, um, and that white Southern women were loyal and devoted throughout the war, um, even when the Confederacy fell apart. So that goes into um, women's associations being the main ones to construct these monuments, like Alyssa um, went through earlier. Um, so, in the 1870s and through the 1920s, Confederate Mor uh, Memorial Association erected more than 1,000 Confederate monuments. Um, so it was a pointed and deliberate effort to control the narrative of the Civil War. Um, uh, the latest memorial associations were mainly active from 1865 to the 1880s, um, and the United, Confeder United Daughters of the Confederacy um, were from the 1894 to the mid-20th century. Um, they didn't just erect monuments, um, they also established Memorial Days, um, they, they created records of the dead, which honored um, the soldiers who were just, um, uh, some of these monuments are to faithful slaves um, and Confederate leaders. They also created essays and quizzes and contests, and they also controlled the textbooks. So they had their hand kind of in every pot that they could to control this narrative of the lost cause, um, this myth of the lost cause. Um, the Union did not just sit back, of course, they also pushed back. Um, and they did so in very much the same ways that the Confederacy was doing that as well. So they erected their own monuments, um, had their own memorial days, um, and had their own clubs. So they were doing all the same things. Um, eventually, however, um, the narrative of the lost cause that the Confederacy made, it won out. Um, that reason uh, has to do with reconciliation. So, of course, after, after the war, the North and South had to come together to form one nation. They had to reconcile. Um, and they tried to do that in, in a, a various ways. Um, both sides agreed that um, their foe was brave. Um, of course, that made them look better. If you have a worthy opponent, a brave opponent, it only makes you look braver. Um, so that was one of the things that they did. However, neither side um, said that the other side fought for a noble cause. So um, though the Union said, yes, the Confederacy was brave, they did not say that they were fighting for a noble cause. Um, neither did the Confederacy of the Union. Um, 
the Confederacy was just more vigilant in their, call, in their cause. They were focused heavily on creating these monuments and creating these organizations, all the while the Union was um, focused more on this reconciliation. So they did things that encouraged nationalism and um, being proud to be a citizen of the United States, um, like encouraging everyone to learn and sing the Star Spangled Banner, um, saying the Pledge of Allegiance, things like that. So that was their main focus. Um, so the Confederacy, that, that narrative of the lost cause kind of took over. Um, I will, uh, I know it speaks fast and I hope you guys got all of that, um, but I will leave you with a quote, I think, um, the Atlanta History Center, um, the History Museum there has um, a great kind of summary of the lost cause um, that goes as follows. Um, Implicit in the lost cause was the belief widely accepted throughout the United States in white racial supremacy. Celebrations of the lost cause often went hand in hand with campaigns to enact laws mandating Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchising African American voters, which also sparked racial violence, including lynching, well into the 20th century. Um, it goes on to say, our understanding of history changes over time. Civil War monuments remain important reminders of how history can be influenced by false ideas and misperceptions. This monument was created to recognize the dedication and sacrifice of Americans who fought to establish the Confederate slave holding republic. Yet, this monument must now remind us that their loss actually meant liberty, justice, and freedom for millions of people, a legacy that continues for all of us today. Um, thank you guys so much. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming tonight. It's uh, great to see this many people, a good turnout. So the monument honors the Confederate States of America, or for shorthand, the Confederacy. Uh, I want to ask three questions about it. Why was it established? Uh, secondly, what was its story in the little over four years that it existed? And then third question, how shortly after it dissolved did its leading supporters create a revisionist history of it? I'll spend the most time on the first of these three questions. Once that's laid out, uh, answering the other two kind of falls more into place. So on the, on the first question, political leaders of seven Southern states established this Confederate States of America in the winter of 1861, and later in the spring, four other Southern states. This was on the heels of their states leaving the USA. That's, that's the technical term for that is secession or seceding. This is a radical political act, right? It's not exactly every day that states leave the USA, right? Um, what, what, why, why did they engage in this radical political act? Their core belief was that crazy fanatics had taken over the USA. Crazy fanatics had taken over the USA. The, the only thing to do was to actually get out of the USA, right? That's how bad things had gotten. Who were these crazy fanatics? They were a relatively new political party. They were called Republicans. And how had they taken over the USA? They'd won in the November 1860 election. They won the presidency, um, and by that point, both houses of Congress. They found the majorities of both houses of Congress. Okay. When I was a kid growing up in Atlanta, I did a school report on Abraham Lincoln. I just thought he was a great American. I did. So, so why would the election of Abraham Lincoln uh, cause, cause you know, bring about this, this drastic political act of secession? For advocates of secession, the Republican Party was the political form of the abolitionist movement. Okay, so what was the abolitionist movement? It originated around 1830. It was a moral religious movement committed to ending slavery. It viewed slavery as the nation's greatest sin, as inherently cruel and unjust. And for the, by the terms of the abolitionist movement, slavery should be ended today. Right? There, there's no ambiguity on this. What was the Republican Party? It originated in the mid-1850s. In the point of view of the Republican Party, slavery was a backwards labor system. A society could not progress or develop based on such a backwards labor system. The Republicans thought you couldn't touch laws about slavery in states where it already existed, right? But there's a whole half of the USA called the West, okay, where you could actually stop slavery from expanding. So that was the one part policy that all Republicans agreed on you could actually stop slavery from expanding west. Right? Here's the thing, for advocates of secession, they conflated the two and saw the Republican Party as basically the political form 
of the abolitionist movement. That, that's not actually accurate in, 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 in real history, right? The abolitionist movement, Republican Party, are different. It doesn't matter. Advocates of secession believed they were basically one and the same, or one's a political version of the other. That caused them to act. That, that's historically meaningful. So to put it all together, they left the USA because they believed that slavery was threatened. And having left the USA, they established new Confederate States of America where slavery could not be threatened. To take one example, the Vice President of the Confederate States of America, Alexander H. Stevens from Georgia, said famously in a speech in March of 1861 that slavery was the, quote, cornerstone of this new Confederate States of America. You can look at the Confederate Constitution, easily found online. Um, it closely parallels the U.S. Constitution, a lot of its lawyerly language. Article, but there's some key differences. Article 1, Section 9 says, no bill of, bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall be passed. Okay. Property rights in slaves would be protected in this Confederate States of America. You can also look at Article 4, Section 3 of this Confederate Constitution, which explicitly says that slavery as it exists in these southern states, should the Confederate States expand west, the same slave, slavery that exists would have, would have free right to, to go west. I've been talking a lot about, we're talking about these, these political leaders, these advocates of secession. Who exactly were these people? They were the elite slaveholders who dominated southern politics. They were very wealthy and they were very powerful. Numerically, they were a small elite. The technical term for them is planters. That doesn't mean someone that plants seed in the ground, like in my vegetable garden, right? Um, but, but a plantation owner. They owned over 20 slaves, usually well over 200 <coughs> acres. Right? Again, numerically small, but a very wealthy and powerful elite. They're the leaders in the secession movement. They're the people that established this Confederate States of America. These planters held power in a society in a social order with simmering tensions. What does that mean? Tensions between elite and non-elite, between slaveholders and slaves. Let me focus on both those, and then we'll move to the second question. The population of the Confederate States of America was about 9 million, a little over 9 million. 60% whites, 38.5% slaves, 1.5% free blacks, so African Americans who through different ways had, had actually gained their freedom and continued to live in states where slavery was legal. Of the 60% white population, 30% of households or families actually own slaves. Right. So what about this other 70% of white families, households that didn't own slaves? They were called yeomen or poor whites. So they owned land, if they were yeomen, they were farmers that worked for themselves. Or if they were poor, poor whites, they didn't even own land. They didn't own slaves, didn't own land either. That's the other sort of majority, 70%. Of the 30% who were actually slave owners, only 12% were actually planters, meaning owning over 20 slaves. Right? So even within the ranks of slave owners, planters are a small elite within that. What about the other 78%? They're basically prosperous yeomen or sort of small planters, right? So there are slave owners, um, but they're not the, the elite planters that dominate politics. So if you, look, if you think about those statistics, this is a society with huge divisions, right? Elite, non-elite, slave holding, and slave. How did it hang together? In 1857, a North Carolina named Hinton Helper published a book called The Impending Crisis of the South. He was from a yeoman area of North Carolina, and he basically said, it's not gonna hold together much longer. Right? There's simmering class, he was interested in class tensions among elite, non-elite whites, the 70%, the 30%, and he believed that, that there was such tension that the crisis soon had to develop, right? At the same time, the class tension was diffused in some ways because only white men could vote, only white men could serve on militias and militia duty, right? And, it, and of course, as the society was structured, only no white person could be a slave. Right? What about the, the, the summary question on slaveholder and slave? Slave owners publicly bragged that their slaves had never even thought about freedom, that they actually enjoyed their enslavement. So Thomas Cobb, one of the people commemorated on the monument, in his speech urging Georgia to, Georgia to secede from the USA in 1860, said, quote, our slaves are the most happy and contented, best fed and best clothed, 
and best paid laboring population in the world, and I would add also the most faithful and least feared. Right. That's kind of the portrait you get in Gone with the Wind. Now, if you look at Southern newspapers, you would find good evidence to undercut that claim. What's the good evidence I'm talking about? Tons and tons of ads for runaway slaves, posted by slave owners who were upset that their valuable slave property had chosen to emancipate his or herself, right? So again, you can go through old Annie Bontone newspapers, <coughs> page, you know, keep, you know, turn the pages, and you'll see tons of these ads for, for runaway slaves. That seems to suggest that slaves were seeking freedom rather than, than being happy uh, in their enslavement. In plantation counties, counties where there are lots of plantations, slave patrols in the evenings were a regular phenomenon, right? Deputized groups of white men that would go around making sure that slaves weren't escaping, that any slave out on the road had a pass from the slave's owner and that they had permission to be out and about, right? So this, even as, as the society, society's leaders publicly bragged that all was fine, they took a, steps to ensure that slaves remained slaves. One example of this was the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, huge political victory for the planters. This put the power of the US government in 1850 behind returning any slave that say made it to a state where slavery didn't exist. So Massachusetts, um, Ohio, right? This said the federal government had to, the slave status remained the slave, even in that state where slavery didn't exist. And federal agents would have to, would see to it that the slave was returned to the slave's rightful owner in the state which that, from which that slave would escape. Let me move to the second uh, question, basically the story of the Confederacy. So the Confederacy existed for a little bit over four years. For the vast majority of its existence, it was at war, right, the Civil War. Right? So it's, it's around for a couple months, uh, and then in April of 1861, war begins, the war will go on until April, May uh, 1865. In the context of the war, the simmering tensions that were already there only increased. Right? What, what do I mean by that? There are a couple key pieces of evidence in the year 1862. In April 1862, the Confederate Congress passed a Conscription Act. All white men between the ages of 18 and 35 had to register for military service. Whenever a government passes a draft, that immediately tells you the numbers of volunteers are not enough. This is a coercive measure that a government takes. This suggests a lack of enthusiasm for the cause. Right? On top of that, this conscription act contained a provision that for on, for on plantations with over 20 slaves, for every 20 slaves, one white man was exempt from military service. Now, who were the people that <laughs> owned more than 20 slaves? They were the elite planters. This did not help class tension inside the Confederacy. So one could start hearing after this act passed the frustrated complaint among many non-slave owning whites, rich man's war, poor man's fight. Okay, at the same time as Confederacies at war with USA, increasing numbers of slaves are escaping to places of US military um, presence. This forces the Lincoln administration to develop some kind of policy on their status. The existing policy in the books was the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, which I referred to earlier, right? By the terms of that act, the US government was bound to return runaway slaves to the rightful owner. By the terms of the Lincoln administration, the Confederacy was not a legitimate country. It was still part of the USA, just in rebellion against its government, right? So if you just follow the strict letter of the law, the US government was supposed to return runaway slaves to their Confederate owners, right, by the terms of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. As, as the Lincoln administration thought about this, ultimately what Lincoln hit on was what we know as the Emancipation Proclamation, which he unveils in September of 1862. It goes into effect in January 1 of 1863. This says that slaves who escape to places of US military presence will be, quote, forever free, right? Why is Lincoln doing this? For the planters that thought the Republican Party was just the political form of the abolitionist movement, they said, see, right, we, we, we knew he was an abolitionist all along. Okay. That's, that's not actually true, right? Um, this is a strategic move, right? So if you're fighting another country or rebellion, whatever you want to call it, right, uh, and their main labor source is running away, that weakens the internal economy, right? 
On top of that, those runaway slaves, based on another provision, the Emancipation Proclamation, could then fight for the USA. Right? So, so on the heels of the Emancipation Proclamation, the US starts forming uh, black regiments. The film Glory is about one of these, right? As the war went on, these tensions didn't go away, they only increased, right? So by war's end, the number of deserters from the Confederate Army was over 100,000. That doesn't suggest heartfelt enthusiasm for the cause, right? Over 100,000. In Eastern Tennessee and Western North Carolina, 50,000, 60,000, the numbers aren't clear. White men organized, either enlisted for the US Army or formed a guerrilla organization called the Heroes of America that actually fought against the Confederate Army. Right? They were unionists, they're, they're white Southern people, they were unionists cheering, cheering for, actively fighting for the other side. Right? If you've seen the film Free State of Jones, excellent film from last year, it's about a rebellion inside the Confederacy where they raise the US flag in Jonestown, Mississippi, and proclaim themselves the Free State of Jones. At the same time, the, with the Emancipation Proclamation, it's incentivized more and more slaves to try and run away, because they knew that if they could get the US military, they were, quote, forever free, right? On top of that, many of them could fight passionately for the USA, since that was now part of the, the war effort, right? By war's end, 200,000 African Americans had fought in the US Army. Some are free blacks in the north, their numbers are pretty small. Many are runaway slaves from, from southern states, from confederate states. Right? Here's a revealing statistic. In Mississippi, more black Mississippians fought for the USA than white Mississippians fought for the confederacy. Right? It's a strange statistic. Right? Mississippi had a slave majority population, their early union victories on the Mississippi River. When all is said and done, more black Mississippians fight for the USA than white Mississippians fight for the Confederacy. Right. Give one example of just the, the changes the war brought. Uh, as the war came to an end in June of 1865, the 33rd US Colored Infantry was here in Augusta, mobilized here in, in occupying Augusta as the war came to an end. They were slaves from, former slaves from South Carolina and Sea Island. <coughs> So, wrapping up this, this second point, the Confederacy did hold together, hold together for four years, right, in the context of war, but there's serious internal divisions and tensions, right, that only get worse over time as the war goes on. Zebulon Vance, Confederate governor of North Carolina, wrote in a private letter, he's not saying this in public, wrote in a private letter to a friend late in 1864, quote, the great popular heart is not now and never has been in this war. It was a revolution of the politicians, not the people. <clears throat> that leads to the third point. Uh, the Confederacy had barely dissolved before its leading supporters were crafting a revisionist history of it, different from the account I just gave. Right? We've heard that in, in uh, Harvey's presentation on the lost cause. The two key things, and this is echoing her, were one, to erase slavery from the conflict. So in Liz's presentation on the Confederate monument, you could look at the monument and not think that slavery had anything to do with that, despite the statements and the secession declarations that I've already read, where it's, it, there's no ambiguity, right? It's stated very, very plainly, right? Second thing in this, in this um, revisionist history, and Harvey touched on this, um, that this revisionist history imagined a unity or solidarity that had never existed, right? Think about the Zebulon Vance quote I just read, the fact that more black Mississippians fought for the USA than white Mississippians for the Confederacy. The Confederacy was not a unified or, or, or solidified society, right? But this revisionist history might imagine this, this uh, unification, this, this solidarity that had actually not existed in war times. In the speeches that uh, were given during the laying of the foundation of the monument in 1875, General Clement Evans, former Confederate general, said, I believe the states were right in making the original issue. It was right to repeal aggression by resistance. It was right to set up a separate government for that purpose. It was right to hold out to the bitter end. Right, right, from first to last, from beginning to end, right? No apology for the Confederacy, right? It was, it was the, the nation was right. The other team just had more people and resources, right? Then in 1878, at the dedication ceremonies when it was finished, former Confederate General Colonel, sorry, former Confederate Colonel, Charles Colcott Jones Jr. said, 
quote, for the past, we have no apologies to offer, no excuses to render, no regrets to utter, save that we failed in our high endeavor. Right? Unapologetic defense of the Confederacy is a good and righteous nation. Right? He continued, even now the fundamental claims in support of which the Southern people, there's that myth of unity, expanded their blood and treasure are in a moral point of view unaffected by the results of the contest. Right? The Confederacy lost in the battlefield, but in the abstract realm of morality, it was actually right. And he concluded, holy cause. The Confederacy was holy. This day, we rest from our secular calendar and set apart as a season of hallowed mm -hmm. recollections. Right? There's our revisionist history uh, and our lost cause. Thank you. Well, good evening, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, I am a native of Augusta, and in some respects, uh, this is a homecoming for me. I live now in Columbia, but my father's family grew up on the corner of Ninth and Walton Way, a few blocks from here. Uh, I was among the first students to attend the old Davis and Fine Arts School, an empty lot, a few blocks from where we are. <laughs> and my very first job that ever I received a salary was in the Augusta Public Library, uh, showing books in the children's department. Um, one of those books um, that was in the children's department was a book that I was quite familiar with in my elementary school. Uh, I went to elementary school at W.S. Hornsby, below East Boundary, and there a librarian named Ms. Eason regularly taught us about local history in Augusta. And she had on the shelf the same book that I would see later at the Augusta Library, a book called Historic Augusta for Kids. This is my copy. On the cover, you will see the Confederate Monument. And as a child, I went to every site in this book, trying to understand the history of these sites. And it's now taken me 30 plus years to come to some deeper understanding of this particular monument. And so when I received the invitation to come tonight, to be a part of this teach-in, uh, I was quite excited to do so. And I will uh, make my comments concise because I want to save time for the discussion and hopefully the debate that will emerge from this conversation. In 1965, the famed essayist and novelist James Baldwin said the following, history as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, on the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us. We are unconsciously <coughs> controlled by it in many ways. And history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is the history that each of us owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. So today, I want to give some context of the time period in which the Confederate monument was created in the 1870s. And I'd like to go back to 1868. If you were to travel down Campbell Street, night, you would see the evolution of a black community <laughs> that extends from uh, Reynolds to the South. As African Americans are now exercising newly found freedom they are building new churches. They are establishing schools. They are creating neighborhoods, Masonic orders, and other organizations. And they're becoming the chief architects of the Republican Party in Augusta and in Georgia. When the November 1868 election emerges, 
a very distinguished member of our community named Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas, who was a regular and dedicated diarist who lived on Green Street, made the following observation as all of these changes were emerging. She said to herself in her diary, the South feels instinctively that she is standing upon the mouth of a volcano, expecting any moment of eruption. Tonight, it is reported that all the houses in the neighborhood are to be burned up. She has in mind a rumor that is circulating in November of 1868 that carpetbaggers, scallywags, and Negro Republicans are set to burn down Augusta, Georgia. When that same time period emerges, we see very quickly the door of reconstruction in Georgia being quickly closed through a number of efforts, but particularly in the 1876, 1877 Constitution that seeks to rewrite many of the gains of the 1868 Constitution. Now, if we were to look closely on the date of the dedication of the monument, it is quite striking. As all the panelists have alluded, it was no ordinary day in Augusta. 10,000 people on broad between 7 and 8. Imagine the scene. Hear the words. Early in the day, the crowd began to assemble on Broad Street. The ladies whose sparkling eyes and ruddy cheeks proclaimed them true daughters of old Georgia. They were out in mass. All Augusta was out, and thousands from the surrounding country swelled the over-increasing throng. Railroads in Georgia and in South Carolina gave discount tickets to be here in Augusta. And among those present were military troops as discussed, including a group called the Hampton Red Shirt Cavalry from Edgefield and Beach Island, who we'll discuss in one moment. Now, one might easily point to the Confederate monument as a sign and symbol of white supremacy. However, if you were to carefully read the dedication speeches, those who spoke were quite careful in how they presented the arguments for the monument. And so my panelists may challenge me, but I've not seen anything explicit that speaks to the monument as a symbol of white supremacy. However, I have found a number of references that are quite implicit in making this case. Consider the prayer of the Reverend C.C. C. Williams, who described the monument as a memorial of our, as an everlasting memorial of our grateful, I'm sorry, of our Confederate dead. And then he says this, Dear Lord, guard it, we beseech thee, from all powers of the air, that no blast of lightning may come nigh to it, and no fury of storm to cast it down. If the noise of war and tumult or sedition be heard again in our land, and the wild passions of men shall surge and swell through now these peaceful streets, Grant that as the flaming sword of cherubim's turn, grant that this monument may stand here as a sign and a witness to all generations. Now, if you were to look closely at those who are recognized and honored on the Confederate monument, I think it begs further discussion and scrutiny. As was mentioned, there are four figures referenced specifically, and one on the top, the unknown, we now know as Barry Benson. Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, William H. T. Walker, who was buried on the campus of Augusta University, and this other figure, T. R. R. Cobb. Now, in one of my assignments with my students, so that'll make history more interesting, I give them a writing assignment and I 
invite them to engage in a debate with a historic figure, or write a letter to an edit editor about a historic figure. And I so wish that this professor could have a debate with T.R.R. Cobb, <laughs> who is prominently featured on the monument. Now, as a kid, looking at that monument in this image, he was just a figure in stone. But Thomas Cobb was probably the strongest and most vociferous, most compelling defender of slavery as a legal, as a legally, morally, and religiously justified institution. He published several volumes, one entitled An Inquiry into the Law of Negro Slavery, and another entitled Historical Sketch of Slavery. And many of the sentiments and claims of Thomas Carr are used decades later to justify the demise of Reconstruction and the continued <clears throat> subjugation and segregation of black people. These are his words, the words of the stone figure on the monument on Broad Street. This inquiry into the physical, mental, and moral development of the Negro race seems to point them clearly as peculiarly fit for a laborious class. Their physical frame is capable of great and long continued exertion. Their mental capacity renders them incapable of successful self-development and yet adapts them for the direction of the wiser race. Their moral character renders them happy, peaceful, contented, and cheerful in a status that would break the spirit and destroy the energies of the Caucasian or the Native American. In mental and moral development, slavery, so far from retorting, has advanced the Negro race. Then he says this, but removing responding to abolitionists, removing the restraining and controlling power of the master, the Negro becomes at once the slave of his lust, the victim of his indolence, relapsing with wonderful rapidity into his pristine barbarism. I want to have a debate with Thomas Cobb. <laughs> Similarly, I would welcome a debate with the keynote speaker that day, a distinguished lawyer and a historian, C.C. Jones, Jr. Jones also offered a word not only about the moment in which the monument is dedicated, but also a word to each of us today in 2018 having this discussion. He says the following. While the cause with which we now emblazon belongs to history, while the bright examples of the virtuous dead who perish in its support will be emulated by men of other ages, and while their good deeds will be treasured as the heritage of many generations. This is 1878. Monuments are connecting links between the present and the past. They symbolize the nobleness which has gone before and betoken a happy recognition of them by those who come after. By betraying the images of the great, they keep ever before our eyes <clears throat> deathless examples. They, they look, the looks and thoughts of sympathy begotten by their heroic presence, give birth to heroism. Within the charm sphere of their influence, the living learn to value and to imitate the true, the beautiful, and the sublime. 1878. Now, in C.C. Jones's History of Augustine, there is little reference at all 
to Reconstruction. In fact, I think there's one page to the period of Reconstruction. So much is silenced and buried in this context. In 1875, three years before the monument is dedicated, there is a convention of colored citizens here in Augusta, and they meet to respond to the eager efforts to cripple Reconstruction. And they also respond to claims that Negro leaders are preparing for yet another alleged insurrection. And they believe that more should be done to assure white Georgia that black leaders have no plans for insurrection, but simply want their rights protected and defended. Now, in this debate, many eyes and many hands point across the river to a little town called Hamburg as perhaps a seat of some of this stirring of insurrection. It was called the Africanized town. That was a word used. A community now under black leadership led by a man named Prince Rivers, who they believe was directing a general massacre against whites. And that is in 1875. And of course, in the summer of 1876 is where the nation learns of the Hamburg Massacre, where African Americans are assassinated, an assassination aided by white citizens of Augusta. When the dust settles on Hamburg, and it's clear about the tragic loss, what occurs in that city three years before the monument is dedicated, the Augusta Chronicle writes a quite curious editorial. And it says, quote, a final picture shows a deserted town. Old Negro women hurrying across the bridge, what is now the Fifth Street Bridge, with all their worldly possessions and fellowships. Augusta Negroes remained throughout the episode quiet in their homes and took no part in the trouble across the river. After the carnage, Hamburg ceased to exist. Now, within our community right now, there is a big debate about what transpired in Hamburg, who was responsible. But black leaders were of the mind in 1876 that Hamburg was, quote, a premeditated and predetermined effort to undermine black liberties and freedom. Black leaders in South Carolina met within weeks of the Hamburg massacre. They were joined by a few Georgians, and they said the, they said the following, there is no law or justice because this band of regulators override all laws except that of violence. So again, that's July of 1876. In September of 1876, Similar tragedies occur in another community called Ellington. In September of 1876, papers describe it as a perfect reign of terror led by white vigilantes, including members of the Hampton Red Shirts, the same group that will be here for the dedication of the monument in 1878. Now, I should tell you that we're trained in graduate school to be objective historians. I'm not objective when it comes to the period of Reconstruction, and I'll tell you why. Uh, as I joined the faculty at the University of South Carolina, I had no idea of my own family history and its connection to Hamburg and Ellington. And one afternoon, I was in the State Archives uh, in Columbia, and I came across a document dated May 9, 1923. It was a petition by a gentleman to receive a Confederate pension. The gentleman served in Company C of the 1st South Carolina Cavalry. And on the application, it notes that he served 
from August 27, 1861 to April 26, 1865. And he signed it with an X showing that he was faithful to the Confederacy. The gentleman's name was Alex Williams, who was my great, great, great grandfather. And it lists his occupation in the Confederacy as servant. So for four years, he travels with his own owners <coughs> serving. Now, underscore serving in a different context for the Confederacy. And in 1923, he receives a pension. Now what is curious is that Alex Williams is the same Alex Williams who testifies before Congress in 1876 about the atrocities that he witnessed and experienced as a Negro Republican in the town of Ellington. And the testimony is fascinating about the degree to which violence is now used as the arbiter of control and power in the, what is now the CSRA region. And what these testimonies also underscore in the same context in which the monument is dedicated is the degree to which African Americans themselves fight back. Some through armed resistance, some through organizing, and many through migration through what is called the Exodus Movement. Fearful that there would be no future for African Americans in the community, there is an active movement to move to points west, Arkansas, and Texas, and also to Liberia. And a significant cohort of Black Augusta citizens in the 1870s, fearful of their own future, leave and move to West Africa. That is a fascinating debate and discussion. One gentleman who writes from Augusta in October of 1877, one year before the marker is the monument is dedicated, says the following: The colored people of Augusta are tired of the constant struggle for life and liberty, and prefer going where there are no such obstacles as now confront and keep them down, and where they can secure for themselves and posterity a free, independent, and national existence. That's 1877. Now, to show why this monument rightly deserves critique and scrutiny, I want to end with an observation by a gentleman who took note of this monument when he came to Augusta in March of 1888, the entire city was fully aware that he was on his way. African-American members of a group called the Sumner Literary Society, named for the radical Republican <clears throat> Charles Sumner, invite this gentleman to Augusta. The Augusta Chronicle talked about his coming and the fear of what he might say. The gentleman's name was Frederick Douglass, and he comes to Augusta in March of 1888, and he is here on a tour, and his, his explicit goal is to provide a summary of what has transpired in the Deep South from the period of emancipation until the late 1880s. And what he reports was quite depressing. These are his words. The people are only nominally free. He described emancipation as a stupendous fraud. And he characterized African Americans in Georgia and South Carolina as, quote, a deserted, swindled, and outcast people. In law, they are free. But in fact, they are still slaves. <clears throat> then he says the following. I have a duty to perform, and that duty is to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. While the nation may forget, it may shut its eyes to the past, 
it may frown upon any of those who may do otherwise. But the colored people of America are bound to keep fresh a memory of the past, keep it alive till justice shall be done in the present. Thank you very much.